Hello ladies and gentlemen, this is the first in a series of five reviews that I'll be doing on The Legend of Zelda. I'll be reviewing Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask, The Wind Waker, Twilight Princess and Skyward Sword. Since The Legend of Zelda is one of the most prominent video game franchises ever, I thought it would be a good idea to turn a critical eye towards them, look at what works, what doesn't and how the series has changed over time. I want to preface all of this by saying that I've completed every Zelda game to date and would consider myself a pretty big fan of the series. That said, I'm not blind to the flaws that exist in every game, and naturally I think some are more of a success than others. If you haven't played the Zelda games before, then you might want to give some of them a try before watching any of these videos, because I'm going to go into pinpoint detail and tell you more about these games than you ever wanted to hear. First up, it's Ocarina of Time. The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time was released back in 1998 for the N64 and is one of the most critically acclaimed games of all time. In fact, you'd be hard pressed to find a game more ingrained in gaming culture as a whole than Ocarina of Time. If you haven't played the original N64 version of the game, the GameCube disc re-release, the Virtual Console version or the revamped 3DS version, then I'd have to recommend you get your hands on a copy just to experience something considered so large a slice of gaming history. But is that slice any good? That's what I'm here to explore today. The intro to the game is narrated by the Deku Tree who gives the setting. Immediately we're thrown into Link's prophetic dreams and can see Ganondorf, the main antagonist. In about 60 seconds of cutscene, the game has gotten across its premise. My favourite thing about the intro in general, however, is the fact that Link is referred to as the boy without a fairy. Right away we know he's different in some way, but it's not made clear why. This foreshadows the minor plot twist later on that Link is a Hylian and not one of the Kokiri. It also helps him stand out as the protagonist. Once the game starts, the player is dropped into the forest village and left to wander around until they find a sword and a shield. This is something that's repeated a lot in Ocarina of Time, leaving the onus squarely on the player to explore their surroundings in order to advance. For example, even though Navi can tell you to go to Death Mountain, it's up to you to find out that you need to bomb the rolling Goron in order to proceed. The game nudges in the right direction without handholding. This is a chance for the player to get used to the controls. Movement is done using the analog stick, providing a great degree of control over Link's movements. One of the most interesting quirks is the lack of a jump button. It's a very deliberate decision to avoid the game venturing into platformer territory. Link will automatically jump upon running off a ledge. This can be one of the hardest parts of the controls to get used to because it flies in the face of conventional gaming wisdom. Normally people are supposed to avoid running off ledges at all costs, but in Ocarina of Time it's required to cross gaps. Link has virtually no mid-air control, which means once you've left off a ledge you're committed to that jump. I'm a fan of Rock's Feather in the 2D games, but I can see why Nintendo might want to save the jumping for one of their other key franchises. Upon arrival at the Deku Tree, the game's first dungeon presents itself. This dungeon, while exceptionally easy to anyone who has played a Zelda game before, provides an excellent introduction to Zelda in a three-dimensional environment. Since previous Zelda games were top-down, one of the major additions that Ocarina provides is room for things to happen vertically as well. The central chamber that the player enters contains a great degree of verticality. There's vines to climb and a puzzle to be solved by realising that you can drop back down into the centre of the room. The item choice for this dungeon also serves as a way for players to get to grips with the new control scheme. The slingshot begs to be used in first person mode to pick Skulltool off the wall. The boss also uses vertical space, hanging off the ceiling until the player looks up to notice it. All in all, the Deku Tree is a great introduction to the basics of a Zelda game, and moreover it's a subtle introduction to Zelda when applied to a 3D space. Before Saria hands over her treasured ocarina, which will later be discarded for the Ocarina of Time, the Deku Tree explains some of the backstory behind the Triforce. According to the story, the world was formed by three goddesses who are also responsible for creating the Triforce. This story has no bearing on the game in the slightest and could have been swapped out with any mystical backstory you could think of. We don't get any reason why the Triforce itself would exist, just that it was left behind after they were gone. These events are so far removed from the things that actually happen in the game that they might as well have not been included. I'm all for fleshing out the world, but this doesn't tell us anything about Hyrule or any of the people living in it that we didn't already know. It just confirms that some goddesses made the world, not a big deal. Unfortunately, the entire story of Ocarina of Time will be told at an absolute crawl thanks to the tech speed, and there's no option to make it go any quicker. Over the course of a single playthrough, this can add up to a very large amount of time wasted. Right before stepping into Hyrule Field, Link is then accosted by a lovely owl who likes to explain things and then politely ask if you want him to repeat himself. I don't really mind the owl, but I find it a bit strange that we never discover a shred of information about who or what he is and why he would want to help Link. Considering how much of a blank slate he is, I like to imagine that it's Shigzi himself speaking to me directly, a bit like an overprotective father. 
He wants to let you have a good time, but he's gonna make damn sure you know where the item subscreen is first, just in case. Speaking of which, the game uses the menu to assign items to one of the C buttons for use while you're playing. The A button is reserved for contact sensitive actions and the B button is permanently assigned to the sword. This is a pretty good system, allowing three items to be assigned at once for instant use. You can't foresee which items you might need around the corner though, which can lead to a lot of menu opening and it's unfortunate that the menu has some short animations on it, slowing down the process more than needs be. Overall though, it's hard to find fault with a system that allows players to have on hand exactly what they want at any given time. Hyrule Field is open up at this point, but it's a bit of an empty promise. With the exception of the Lon Lon Ranch in the centre, there really isn't anything to discover apart from some tiny hidden caves. There's also the fact that Lake Hilly and the Gerudo Desert are completely off limits to begin with. This may be an overly harsh assessment, but rather than just being a hub for the other areas, I think that Hyrule Field mostly just serves as padding. During the PS1 and N64 era, developers were really only coming to grips with making the sorts of 3D environments for games that have become the standard now. As a result, it was significantly more time consuming and difficult for levels to be constructed. Nintendo recognised this fact and used some clever means to cut down on the amount of work they would have to do. With Super Mario 64, they reused the same level several times, simply changing the objective to provide a new challenge. In Ocarina of Time, Hyrule Field helps serve as some inexpensive padding, and the time travel mechanic also means that many areas of the game can be used twice with little to no alterations to the geometry. When I say that Hyrule Field is padding, I really don't mean anything too harsh by that, it's just the centre of the game. It gives some space to breathe, it separates the various areas and it acts as a hub. It's just a shame that there's barely anything to do in it but run and fight the occasional enemy at night time. Speaking of night time, the game includes a day and night system with time passing gradually in areas outside towns. Very little changes between day and night except in the towns where things are usually deserted after dark. It's a shame that time doesn't pass while in any of the NPC filled areas, but it's understandable as well considering the technology at the time and how vast the world is. I like that day and night cycle so quickly as well, as it means if you're stuck for something that only occurs during one period, you don't have to wait long for it to change out. You can also use the Sun Song if you've found it in the Royal Family Crypt. The Ocarina really comes into play after traversing Hyrule Field and talking to Princess Zelda, who gives a bit more of an idea about what's going on, and sets Link off on the quest proper. Zelda's lullaby is introduced as a sort of magic catch-all excuse for puzzle solving. I like that it encourages use of the ocarina, but its uses vary so widely that the only way to know when to use it is to look for the Triforce insignia on the ground and play the song, removing any puzzle solving element entirely. The ocarina itself is a nice inclusion, allowing players to mess around with it as much as they like. It's impressive that so many songs were crafted with the ocarina in mind, considering it can only play five notes. These five notes are used as the introduction to some of the most iconic Zelda tunes ever. Zelda's lullaby, the song of time, Saria's song, the song of storms, and the sun song all begin with notes played on the ocarina. The quality of the music throughout the game is great, but more importantly than that, the game knows when to restrain itself. In the jump from 2D to 3D, it might have been tempting to keep the same catchy tunes of old playing throughout the whole game, but ocarina uses understated music for the dungeons, which is good because sometimes that music will be on loop for well over an hour. It saves the catchy tunes for shorter segments where they won't get worn out with use. On the topic of audio, it's worth mentioning that the game lacks any voice acting, even in cutscenes. Audio is one of the most space consuming assets to have in a game, and considering the entire thing needed to fit on a 32MB cartridge, it's no surprise that the developers elected not to include voices. I don't see this as a flaw with Ocarina of Time, especially when you consider how badly the voice acting was in games back then. If anything, this would have dated the game horribly. Even these days, any voices in a Zelda game would probably come out sounding incredibly forced and ruin the experience. The goal as a child is to collect three important stones, which mimics the introduction used in A Link to the Past, where Link has to collect three pendants before the Dark World opens up. Similarly in Ocarina, it's only after Link collects the three stones does the time travel element open up. You could say that Ocarina of Time is really just A Link to the Past made 3D. A Link to the Past has the boomerang, bow, four bottles, a fire rod, an ice rod, a hook shot, bombs, power gloves and a hammer. There's even a flute that looks suspiciously like an Ocarina. The remaining two child dungeons are guarded by the Gorons and the Zora, both of who are introduced in Ocarina of Time. The Zelda series is, in many ways, a traditional fantasy series. It's got swords and magic and civilizations with ancient histories and traditions behind them. I'm incredibly glad, however, that Nintendo elected to be original with the inclusions of the Goron and the Zora in the place of more common races for a fantasy settings like, say, dwarves and elves. The Gorons and the Zora fill traditional roles here, the Gorons are a proud people who value warriors, and the Zoras feel a bit more aloof compared to the other races, but thanks to their unique designs they feel distinctly Zelda. 
The Gorons and the Zora are featured between dungeons and in many ways the parts between dungeons can be the most difficult parts of Ocarina of Time, purely because the game gives you so little direction. The Zoras, for example, require you to play Zelda's Lullaby just to get into their domain. From there you have to dive down to Hyrule Lake, find a bottle under the surface of the water, and hand the letter inside to King Zora. After all that, you have to figure out that Jabu Jabu will only open his mouth if you try to feed him fish, so you need to catch one and dump it in front of him. The game hints towards all these things, but I'd be surprised if most people don't encounter at least one speed bump over the course of the game, where they have no idea how to proceed for a while until they just start trying random things out. By the way, once you do handle letter over the King's Aura, the ultimate act of pissing players off for no reasons happens. In case anyone confuses this with me complaining, I'm not. There's no denying the sequence is annoying, but it's the fun kind of annoying. And I'll probably subject you to it again before this video is over. Jabu Jabu's Belly, the third and final child dungeon, has one of the better settings for a dungeon just because it's quite memorable. There's no confusing this dungeon with any others and I think it's a shame that they don't put this sort of effort into making every dungeon feel unique all the time. Escorting Princess Ruo through the dungeon can be a bit annoying, but it's easy to see where Ocarina implicitly understands some things that other games at the time, and even well afterwards, don't. Princess Ruto doesn't have a health bar, she can't die, I don't have to worry about her AI because you pick her up to move her around. She's less of an annoying AI character that you need to keep alive, and more of a prop you have to use to get through the dungeon, which is fine by me. Once the player has the three stones, it's back to town where Link's nightmare comes through and he meets Ganondorf, who has the most fucking massive nose in computer game history. I mean, look at that thing. Little does Link know as well, he's about to grow into a massive nose of his own, but I get ahead of myself. The Ocarina of Time opens up the Temple of Time where the game will skip forward seven years into the future. There's a bit of an unnecessary cutscene where Ganon tells how this was his plan all along, blah blah blah, and then a bit more exposition. We're told that Ganon has basically won, he's got his hands on the Triforce and took over the Sacred Realm. Link got sealed away for seven years so he could grow old enough to take him on and grow a massive nose. Alright look, I'm sorry to harp on about this and I know it's an old game, but it's not like the polygons had to have a minimum size, it's just, I mean look at like child Link's nose, look at that. That's reasonable. Then look at this thing. Unreasonable. Anyway, from here on out, most of the game is played as adult Link in the future, and it's a great idea for the plot. In most action adventure style games that revolve around saving the world, you're given some idyllic place that needs protection, or a post apocalyptic world where the struggle of the people compels you to try and help them. Either of these scenarios can only be so effective because we're left wondering about what exactly it is we're trying to prevent or what exactly it is we're trying to restore. As soon as you walk into Hyrule Town seven years on, Ocarina of Time has answered both of these questions. You have an immediate comparison in your mind of what Hyrule should look like and what it does look like now. Each Zelda game generally has some sort of twist on it that the others don't. In this case, it's the time travel element. As I said before, there are comparisons to be brought between this and the Dark World from A Link to the Past. In fact, the mechanic of having two separate but interlinked worlds is a very common one in the Zelda series as a whole now. It's present in A Link to the Past, Ocarina of Time, Oracle of Ages, Oracle of Seasons, The Minish Cap and Twilight Princess. The time travel element was pretty original for a game at the time. Although I'd argue it could have easily been influenced by Chrono Trigger, it was something that hadn't been done in the Zelda series and adds a lot of atmosphere to the game and expands the story. However, it's not without some major problems. The biggest issue for me has always been the fact that time travel can only occur at the Temple of Time, which means if you want to move from one era to another, you have to go through a lengthy sequence of warping back to the temple, using the Master Sword, and then making your way back to wherever it was you wanted to go. Depending on where you need to be, this can be an extremely lengthy process. The real shame here is that A Link to the Past had a more elegant solution, whereby the player could use the Magic Mirror to swap between worlds at most locations. If swapping worlds resulted in the player being clipped inside an object, it simply swapped them back. The rules behind the time travel also bother me because of how inconsistent they are. Here's two examples. In the first case, Link can buy magic beans as a child, which are then planted in various locations and are of no use until seven years in the future when they can be used by adult Link to reach new places. If you haven't planted something there as a child, there won't be anything there to use as an adult. In the second case, Adult Link learns the Song of Storms from the guy in the windmill, who's annoyed about Link having played it years before. Link then goes back in time and plays the song, causing the guy to be annoyed in the first place. 
This is a closed time loop where the man teaches Link the song and Link teaches the man the song. In other words, the event in the future happens before the event in the past, causing a cycle with no beginning, where both events were always destined to happen. The plants operate on a different idea entirely. If they use the same logic as the Song of Storm scenario, then the plants would always be grown in the future because the game would assume that young Link would plant them in the past. If the Song of Storm scenario worked by the logic used on the plants, then the guy couldn't possibly have taught Link the song in the future until young Link played it in the past. Basically all of this is to say that the time travel in Ocarina of Time probably wasn't thought out to a huge degree, and the developers simply went with whatever they thought was a good idea for certain parts of the game. When you look at the Magic Beans and the Song of Storms, they're both good ideas and I like the way they play with the time travel, the problem is they're incompatible with each other. My last complaint about the time travel is that it's arguable how much it adds from a gameplay perspective. Aside from a few small things in the overworld, the past and the future don't really interact much. The biggest change is the transition from Child Link to Adult Link, but this is more arbitrary than it appears. The game restricts certain items to one or the other, but there's really no reason why Child Link couldn't use the hookshot, or Adult Link couldn't use the boomerang. In fact, in subsequent games, both of these things happen. It's not hard to imagine tacking some new areas onto the overworld, which contain the last five dungeons, and scrapping the time travel idea entirely. Don't get me wrong, I wouldn't enjoy the game more were the time travel element removed, but it's a shame that it's not a more core concept. If, say, there had been places in dungeons where Link could warp through time, it would have added another layer of complexity to the puzzles and thus made them more satisfying. As it is, the two time periods are too separated from each other to result in much. Once the transition to the future is complete, Sheik is introduced immediately and seen occasionally over the rest of the game. Overall, I think that Sheik is one of the best elements of the story in Ocarina of Time. The cutscenes with her are brief, never lasting more than a minute or two. They serve a valuable function by teaching Link the songs needed to warp to the various temples. And they lead up to the twist that Sheik is actually Zelda in disguise. The storytelling in Ocarina of Time is hardly anything groundbreaking or amazing, and the core ideas had already been played out in other Zelda games, but what Ocarina does well is use a couple of little scenarios to expand the characters. Like the fact that Link is actually a Hillian. It works well in the context of the story, it's foreshadowed a little bit before it's briefly explained, and it lends a weird, interesting atmosphere to the village when you talk to the Kokiri and none of them realise they're speaking to Link. Neither Sheik nor Link's history are necessary elements to the narrative. They could easily be removed without any major changes to the core story, but they're quick ways to make the characters and their situation that little bit more interesting, which is good because the main story itself doesn't really have any surprises. I suppose the biggest other shock is that Link doesn't defeat Ganon as a child, meaning those miserable seven intervening years won't be wiped away. It's a bit more grim than you'd expect from a Nintendo game, considering they hadn't released Majora's Mask at the time, I mean. The hookshot is the first item obtained in the future and I find it highlights how difficult it is to make accurate shots in first person mode. It's hard to move the camera any slower than full speed which makes the controls feel rather digital. Since the hookshot often needs to be used on small, distant targets, what this usually means for me is I'll go past the target and have to go back over it, sometimes doing this several times before managing to stop at the right time. It could have done with a bit more smoothing out because as it is it feels very jerky. The forest temple immediately after the hookshot increases the difficulty by an appropriate amount since Link is now in the future. Combat with the Stalfos enemies is tough and the boss fight is one of the best bosses in the game if not the best. The worst thing it has going against it is the arena around it where some of the ropes and poles can get in the way of the camera and spoil the view of the action. I find it a bit strange that Link never gets to see Saria again until she suddenly pops up at the end of this dungeon to say thanks. Ultimately, I don't think it would have benefited the game to give Saria more screen time, but it seems to me like maybe there were bigger intentions for her, she seems to play a fairly big role at the start of the game. Once Link leaves the forest, she's more or less forgotten about until this scene. After the forest temple, it's onto the fire temple, which requires a new tunic for Link to enter. I feel that these tunics are one of the most underutilised elements in Ocarina of Time, they could have been used to make the exploration more rewarding. The big problem with them is that they're really a single use item. For example, the fire tunic is only needed in the fire temple, there are no other points in the game that require it to proceed, but the real question here is why shouldn't there be? It would feel kind of pointless to have an area later on where Link simply has to equip the tunic again, but areas earlier on could have been used as a way to reward exploration. If a player remembers going into a hot place that they couldn't access, they could then backtrack there and be rewarded for their exploration with a heart piece or something similar. I think largely the mistake here was giving the player the two tunics back to back. If they had been staggered out with one only coming near the end of the game, then it could have been used to explore more previously inaccessible areas. Once into the fire temple, the item here is the hammer, which is barely used at all 
and really just hammer some rusted buttons into the ground. After you've finished the dungeon, you almost never have to use it again unless you want to smash the occasional rock. I think this dungeon highlights one of the best things about the way Ocarina of Time handles Link being a hero though. Rather than go through the entire game of killing monsters with barely any interaction with the people of the world, in Ocarina, Link actually accomplishes a series of miniature victories. He helps the new Deku tree to grow, he helps unfreeze the Zora people, and in the Fire Temple, he actually rescues the entire Goron town one Goron at a time. I like how this makes it more believable when Link is praised by somebody for doing good. He's not out in the middle of nowhere on a quest on his own, he's actually helping to put the world back in order. Now before I go on and talk about the Water Temple, I'd uh, like to take a break from dungeon crawling to talk about some of the side quests and minigames. I suppose the most important side quest in the game is the opponent one. It seems strange to refer to it as a side quest, and I don't know how I never managed to notice this on previous playthroughs, but the entire opponent section of the game isn't necessary for completion. It's funny because when you think of Ocarina of Time, you probably picture Link on horseback going through Hyrule Field, after all that's what the title screen presents you with, but it's something that's entirely optional. There's surprisingly little to say about Epona, the quest leading up to her is good, and utilise the time travel well, which is nice, but really she's just a mode of transport. It's enjoyable to ride around the field though, and it vastly improves the travel time from one side to the other, which is great. You can use Epona at the Gerudo Fortress to play one of the many minigames. In this case, some target practice on horseback. It's probably the most enjoyable minigame purely because it feels great to be cruising along and firing arrows. Unfortunately, it doesn't really translate into something you can do when you're riding around Hyrule Field, because the horse is controlled for you automatically during the minigame. Even when you're out in the field anyway, there's only the occasional Poe to shoot at and that's about it. The normal shooting gallery games easily translate into skills that you can use during regular gameplay. Unfortunately, the layout of the targets is not randomised, meaning after you've played it a few times, it becomes a simple case of getting into position for your next shot ahead of time. Similarly, the Bomb Chew Alley uses an item from Link's inventory as a basis for the game. It can be kind of infuriating how precise a shot needs to be to make it all the way down to the end, and the randomization of the prizes is a pointless annoyance. If you screw up your chance to get the Heart Beast, you have to play over and over again until it comes back up. The fishing minigame stands in contrast to these others because there's no limit on how long you can play, or how many fish you can catch. The only objective is to see if you can catch a big one. I've never really been much for this fishing game, but I can see why its inclusion is worthwhile, because it's a nice relaxing way to spend some time in the game in between outings. I find the pace of it a bit too slow for me, but I can hardly complain about it, I mean this is fishing we're talking about. The last minigame I want to talk about is the treasure chest game, which is a wonderful example of encouraging children to cheat their way through life. You walk into a room with two chests, one contains a key, and the other contains a rupee. If you get a key five times in a row, you get a heart piece, but randomly picking a chest each time will only get you to the heart piece 1.6% of the time. The much superior way is to use the lens of truth to peer into the contents of the chests and win just by picking the keys. It's not a deep or challenging minigame, but the realisation that you can cheat is worth the price of admission. There are also a couple of other side quests in the game beside the opponent one, one of those being selling the masks from the Happy Mask Shop. After selling the Keaton mask, it can be incredibly difficult to figure out who to sell the remaining masks to, and the only real approach is trial and error. Thankfully the game makes the trial and error interesting at least, because equipping a mask usually elicits a response out of the NPCs. They're nothing complicated, but they're a great touch and help make the people of Ocarina of Time feel more alive and less like wandering text box viewing nodes. The reward for this quest is the Mask of Truth, which can be used to talk to the Sheikah stones throughout the game. Mostly it's just there to help people track down whatever few remaining secrets there might be in the game and give them that nudge along to 100%, because that last couple of percent is always the hardest. I'm willing to admit that the trading sequence where you get the cuckoo egg and eventually trade objects all the way until you have the big Goron sword is only a decent addition to the game. Nothing more, nothing less. But I find myself oddly attached to it and I think it's one of those little Zelda traditions that should be included in every Zelda game, no matter how small, just because it's kind of nice to have it there. The Skulltulla side quest encompasses the whole game and requires Link to track down 100 gold Skulltulla in order to complete it. Collecting the Skulltulla tokens is surprisingly satisfying, probably because you're aware there's a fixed number of them, so everyone in the game brings you a step closer to completion. Really, you can get most of the rewards for just tracking down 50, this will be enough to unlock the larger wallets for holding more rupees. The size of the rupee wallet is annoyingly small, but there's not much to spend your rupees on anyway, so I guess it doesn't really matter. The side quests feature a wide cast of characters, and while none of them have much going on in the way of development, they're all very full of personality. 
They're sort of like characters, but I mean that in the best way possible. A game like Ocarina of Time doesn't necessarily need deep or complex people to be inhabiting the world in order for them to be interesting and likeable. So yeah, uh, that's the side quests in the minigames. And now I'll talk about the War Temple. Alright, so I'm going to talk about the Water Temple. I'm just, I'm just going to come out and say it. The Water Temple in Ocarina of Time is the worst dungeon in the game, and maybe the worst dungeon in Zelda history. Much has been said about this infamous temple, mostly the fact that it's difficult, but I think people who say this are really missing the point. The Water Temple is not difficult, it's tedious. It's the most tedious thing anyone is subjected to in Ocarina of Time, and the main reason behind that is the Iron Boots. The Iron Boots are acquired a little bit before the temple, and allow Link to drop down to the bottom of Lake Hylia so he can enter it. While I'm talking about the boots, I might as well just say that on a basic level their inclusion irks me a bit because they make absolutely no sense. If we presume that Link actually carries his items, then the Iron Boots will be constantly weighing him down from the moment he picks them up. I know most of Link's inventory doesn't show up on his character model, but I presume we're supposed to use our imagination to fill in the blanks. Anyway, that logical inconsistency aside, which a lot of games are guilty of, admittedly, the real problem with the boots is that you're required to go into the menu to equip them. Since the only way to rise or fall in water is to equip or unequip the boots, this means the menu is in constant use during the Water Temple. This brings the game to a grinding halt, and sometimes you're forced to go into the menu, come back out, and go back in again within the space of several seconds. It's incredibly tedious. Not only is it bad enough on its own, but it compounds on itself by making exploration a hassle, when I know that moving from one room to another will force me to open the menu several times, it slows down decision making and the willingness to just explore. This issue is so incredibly bad that I have no idea how it made it into the final game. It takes an otherwise enjoyable set of puzzles and mangles them entirely. All that needed to be done to solve this issue was allow the boots to be assignable to one of the C buttons like other items, but you can't. I would be remiss if I did not mention that the 3DS version of the game fixes this issue and makes the Water Temple a much more painless experience. To be honest, of all things the 3DS version has going for it, it's this simple improvement that probably has the largest impact on my overall enjoyment of the game, and I think it shows that the Water Temple is not significantly more difficult than any other temple in the game, it's merely tedious. The Water Temple also suffers from having the Dark Link mini-boss, which I think many people are attached to simply because it looks like Link. To me, this is the most disappointing boss fight in Zelda history, because the game all but forces you to kill Dark Link using the cheapest method you can find. Ideally, what this fight would have been is a sword duel versus an AI with all the same tricks as you, but instead what you get is a character that can counter your every move, and in a case where you have the upper hand, it'll often simply glitch out and pretend that you missed. There's nothing fair or interesting about this, and the most common tactics for beating this boss are Din's Fire and the Hammer, both of which are incredibly anticlimactic. I tried several times to have a sword fight with Dark Link and got my ass unfairly handed to me every time because the game decided it didn't like being hit. When I tried the Hammer instead, this is what happened. The difference is staggering, and highlights just how much this boss fails to deliver on its premise. Even more disappointing is the fact that the jars outside the boss fight always seem to drop magic, obviously for use with Din's fire. This means the development team were probably well aware that the best way to kill this boss was with magic, and they did nothing about it. After finally escaping the horrors of the Water Temple, only the Spirit and Shadow Temples remain. The Shadow Temple requires liberal use of the Eye of Truth and grants Link the Hover Boots, which are a good concept, but suffer from the same issues as the Iron Boots. If they were mapped to a button, they would have been a lot better. Thankfully, the dungeon doesn't require them to be used too much, so it never becomes the grating issue that the Iron Boots were in the Water Temple. In a break from the usual Zelda formula of gaining a new item and then using it on the boss, Bongo Bongo uses the Eye of Truth and the Bow, and it actually winds up being one of the most enjoyable boss fights in the game. Perhaps this is a tradition they should break out of more often. Gaining access to the Spirit Temple involves navigating the Gerudo compound, which is guarded by the women of the tribe. Being caught results in Link being thrown into a cell and having to escape. This area of the game highlights the poor camera controls more so than any other section. It's incredibly difficult to get a grip on your surroundings, and moving the camera requires attempting to position Link and pressing the L button to see if you'll be granted a good point of view. 
In most of the game this isn't an issue, because the areas are usually quite open, but in cramped spaces it can be a hassle, and combining it with such a harsh punishment just for being seen by an enemy is a bit much. For me this place turned into a trial and error approach of getting caught and realising not to go that way again. While I'm talking about the camera though I should say, there's a reason that Ocarina of Time popularised the L targeting technique of handling battles. I can't think of any better way to control a character in a sword fight than this because it allows for a great degree of focus and immensely helps strafing and positioning. Combat in general controls well, Link is mobile and the shield works exactly the way you would hope, being raised with the R button. This is a far better approach than the previous series standard where the shield is raised whenever Link is not attacking. The only problem with the L targeting is that it's not as accurate or responsive as it should be. It seems that both the camera and Link need to have the enemy in sight before the game will feel comfortable locking on. This might sound good in theory, but in practice it makes it annoying to lock on to some enemies, particularly if you're running away from one which is out of sight. Navi flies out to any enemy you've locked onto, and this travel time also seems to affect how willing the game is to let you target an enemy. Navi shouldn't be a factor in this equation, so it's a shame that this can sometimes result in a lock on happening later than you wanted it to. Combat usually works best with the human shaped enemies in the game, so it's good that they're in abundance. This really allows the one on one combat and sword fighting to shine through. Most under enemies tend to be simple to dispatch and feel a bit more like a nuisance rather than a threat. I think it's a shame that the game doesn't elevate the tension more often when it comes to fights. The difficulty is staggered out very well though, in the first dungeon most of the enemies aren't even capable of movement, meaning the player can easily back away if they're running low on hearts. By the end of the game you're taking on multiple dark nuts at once, who do several hearts of damage if they manage to connect. The Redeads are one of the better enemy additions in Ocarina of Time and if you want to see the creepiest little touch in the game, go to Hyrule Town and kill one of them. All the other Redeads will ignore Link and slowly walk towards their fallen friend. I have no idea why this happens but it's nice that it's in there. While the game probably could have done with a little bit more variety when it comes to the enemies, all in all the ones that are there perform their roles very well. The Gerudo Fortress reveals an interesting fact about the history of their people. Basically, once every 100 years a male child is born to the Gerudo and the rest are women. Now, you have to stop and ask yourself, did Nintendo really think out the implications of this in the slightest? Firstly, it makes you wonder about Ganon. I mean, why is he so unhappy if he's the only man, a king? In a tribe of women, you know, you'd think he'd be kind of busy doing other things to the rest of the tribe. Although, you know, when you actually think about this, the answer kind of becomes clear. See, the Gerudo seem to have normal lifespans, because at the start of the game you see Ganon, and he looks younger than he does later on. He's clearly aged 7 years. A man will remain fertile even if he lives to be 100 years of age. A woman won't. Do you see where I'm going with this? Because it's pretty horrible. In order to have a male heir, Ganon would need to have a daughter first. And then he'd need to have a daughter with that daughter. And then he'd have to have a son with his granddaughter. I'll just let that one sink in for a minute. The Spear Temple is an interesting one because it requires a visit in both the past and the future. Unfortunately, because the game requires you to use the Temple of Time, this dungeon is simply broken into two halves. You visit it as Young Link and then as Adult Link. You get two items here, first the Silver Gauntlets, which are used to move bigger blocks around. I have no problem with their inclusion from a gameplay standpoint, but one thing about them really annoys me. Presumably they increase Link's strength or else he wouldn't be able to move the massive blocks that he does. And yet, even once you're capable of pushing these larger blocks around, Link will still struggle to move the much smaller ones. The Gauntlets just unlock the ability to move the new blocks without considering what else should change if Link is granted extra strength. This happens again later on in the game, when the Golden Gauntlets are obtained. Link can now lift enormous blocks and hurl them through the air, but will struggle to push a standard block across the ground. The Mirror Shield is a much better inclusion and one of the best items in the game. It doesn't offer Link a huge amount of utility, but the fact that it's integrated with the existing control scheme is great. Rather than having to assign it to a button, you just pull out the shield as normal to use as a reflective surface. The Mirror Shield is such a perfect inclusion, that I think it should be put in every single Zelda game in the future. There are absolutely no downsides to having this item in the game, because it works so well. I mean Link's always going to have a shield anyway, so you might as well make it a mirror shield. After this it's the end of the game, and there's just Ganon's castle ahead before the final fight with Ganon himself. 
These rooms, which echo earlier parts of the game, are hardly very difficult or intricate puzzles, but they're a nice way to round out the game and put most of the items to use one last time before the curtain closes. On my latest playthrough, the initial fight with Ganon went so horribly that I ended up running out of magic before I even beat his first form. No problem, I thought to myself. There must be some other way to defeat him, of course, right? Well, if you know it, good for you, because I definitely do not. I ended up impotently standing around trying to damage him somehow and being totally unable. You could argue that this is entirely deserved of me for not bringing magic potion or something, but for a final boss to allow such a thing to happen is pretty bad. I ended up having to reset the game which utterly killed my motivation to complete it right as I was at the end. The way I see it, as long as the player still has hearts left, that's the most valuable thing, as long as they still have hearts, they should be able to make a comeback but just because my magic meter was depleted I had no such option. Apart from this issue, the fight is just a mirror of the Phantom Ganon fight from earlier on. Things get more serious after Link and Zelda escape the crumbling castle and Ganon shows up again in his final form. This beast is a fitting end boss for a game with the scope of Ocarina of Time and it plays out pretty well. I like that this boss removes a Master Sword from Link. All too often games focus on making enemies stronger when they need something to be intimidating. The end fight with Ganon is intimidating not because he's so huge, I mean Link fights larger enemies in the game, but because the sword is taken away. It's a tool that Link has had since the start of the game, and playing without it feels kinda naked. The sword is then returned, which lends a new atmosphere to the fight, like Link is ready to gain the upper hand. It's a simple turn of events, but very effective nonetheless. Once the final blow is delivered to Ganon, that concludes Ocarina of Time. There's a short epilogue where Link is seen visiting Zelda as a child. I'm not sure how much sense this makes given the time travel mechanics in Ocarina, but I've already shown how the time travel is inconsistent anyway, so I'm not going to harp on about it as much as I'd kind of like to. It's a nice ending to an otherwise fairly grim game. So much has been said about Ocarina of Time that when I started this review I wasn't really sure what I could add to the conversation. All I've really done is analyse the different parts of the game and give some reasons why I think it worked or it didn't. Ocarina is possibly the most praised game of all time however, and you'll frequently find it at the top of lists touting it as the greatest video game ever made. I'm not sure I could tell you whether or not I believe that. I know I enjoy other games and even other Zelda games more than I enjoy Ocarina of Time, but there's no denying that for a game made back in 1998 for the N64, it pushed itself very, very far. Does Ocarina of Time live up to its own hype? My answer to that would have to be no. It's been praised far beyond the point that any game could live up to, so I think it's pointless to judge it by those impossibly high standards. Instead, the most important thing I could tell you about Ocarina of Time today is that over 10 years after its release, you can go back, play it, and you won't be disappointed. It's as enjoyable today as it was years ago. Early 3D games have aged horribly in comparison to almost any other generation of games ever made. They looked blocky, and the controls weren't always as precise or well thought out as they should have been. Ocarina of Time's graphics have aged, they were always going to, but its gameplay stands tall to the point where I'm confident that anyone could pick it up today and enjoy it immensely, regardless of whether or not they had played it before. Funnily enough, the one thing Ocarina of Time has done better than any other game released in that period is stand the test of time itself. In the next video I'll be looking at the black sheep of the Zelda family, Majora's Mask. So I hope you'll join me then, thanks for watching. Oh, 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 oh,